to the Nightbird Radio Podcast. I'm Timothy Saylor, and I'm going to be your host this evening as we sound out the subconscious, navigate the nocturnal, and explore the farthest reaches of our experience. Coming at you from the back of an 86 Dodge Ram van on the rolling foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the Great Forest, deep in the heart of the Kali Yuga. This is Radio for the Hauntological Turn. And welcome back, Nightbirds. It's great to have you back, and it's great to be back. On this episode, I'm joined by Lance Baker. Lance is a hypnotherapist and a Reiki healer who plies his trade at www.branchesofhealing.com. Lance, how are you doing today? Good. Also, .au because I'm Australian. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Pardon me. Branchesofhealing.au. Okay. Does it forward or? .com.au. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, yeah. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. I'm doing well. Yeah, yeah. Just a little hot up here, you know? <laughs> yes. Up here on this Ooh, side. The, on this side <laughs> of the sphere, or is it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I'm it's it's exciting to have you on. I've actually been wanting to ask you on for a while. And um, you know, things just they they work out when they work out. Um for the people that aren't familiar with you do you want to just give a quick rundown of um who you are where they can find you and what you offer uh yeah um and australian healer of very kinds i'd uh i work with the subconscious and hypnosis is probably a it's the term i use uh it's probably not the term of what i do like hypnos comes from Greek god, hypnos of god of sleep. I don't even get people to close their eyes most of the time. Uh, they're awake. I, I create two-way conversation with deeper aspects of their soul. Uh, and you, you've, you've had a play before. I've taught you the, the experience and that two-way communication. You can get a lot more. So hypnosis depends on who you talk to or what it is. <laughs> no, most would say the person's got to be in a trance and it's usually talking at the subconscious, but I like to create that pathway to get two-way stuff happening and phenomena that shows we're talking to the other. Uh, and I work a lot with energy healing as well. That's what was the gateway to bring me into this this world. Uh, and And that can be used for all sorts of Things emotionally, physically, spiritually, stuff like that, that cured a decade long migraine for me uh, and sparked that desire. And so I do various things with those two tools and counseling um, to help heal people in my, my daily clinic online and face to face. Yeah, it's amazing to me how that works because I, yeah, like you said, I have done a session with you. For um, a two-way communication, you called it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's that's really good because it that's deeper to me, like to the heart of what it is. Because I remember when we started doing it, I was like, I mean, I we were we were in the middle of it, and I was like, when are we going to do the hypnotism, dude? Like, <laughs> I was like, when he, when am I going to like, you know, are you going to make me like cluck like a chicken? You know what I mean? Because I'd I'd actually seen it like a stage show, right? Where they did all that stuff in Vegas. And so I had this, I think this conception that a lot of people have around what it is, and I'm sure they're doing some of it there, but what was cool about it when you did it was, it was just like, I was like, okay, is there something happening? But then all of a sudden you were doing things that my body was responding to that I wasn't even consciously responding to like you would ask my hand to move and, and then it would move and i'm like whoa wait that really that was cool man uh yes it is cool so yes i i spend my life mostly talking to people's hands which is a little bit weird because i'm not a puppeteer 
Hey man, it's just a good part of the need to talk to. Um, Tan's got a lot of stories to tell. They do. Yeah. And so, um, so you, uh, for the listeners, you know, you helped me to learn how to back up the truck and not only that, but like some other cool stuff that I was having difficulties with and that, and it worked great. It was, I don't know that we ever really had a follow up on it. Huh. I mean, I maybe messaged you once or twice, but it, yeah, it, it worked so well that we didn't even need to do it again. I want to come back for some more stuff because I've been having some wild stuff going on. We might get into it. We might not, but yeah. So, um, you mentioned that, that the energy healing cured you from, a, did you say a 10 year long migraine? Pretty much. It was, was a bit over nine and a half years from. Yeah, we can call August that. April. We can call that. We'll call it yeah, yeah. <laughs> from when, when, it, when it doesn't stop for a, a split second in between that time, that's a decade. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd uh, I had brain surgery and they fucked it up. I, I can swear on this podcast, I'm presuming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're good. Yeah, yeah. totally. We we swear. Uh, yeah, they fucked it up, and I woke up and I had a migraine, uh, and it just didn't go away. And uh, I tried everything most medicine had to offer. Um, didn't get anywhere. I tried a big long list of all these sort of kinds of drugs to to get rid of it. None could like put much of a dent in it. Uh, the best they could do to stop it was put me to sleep, and that was it. And that was just me being unconscious to it, not <laughs> having the pain actually stop. Um, and so it. The operation happened the day after my birthday. So every year I knew coming up, like, this is one year, this is two years, this is three years, and so on. And so on the, on, um, on the night of my 33rd birthday was, was nine years the next morning was going to be. Uh, and so I, I told myself, I, I, I can't keep doing this. Like, I, I, I'd come to acceptance stage and was just, this is my lot in life and I'll just live it. And, uh, and I was like, you know what? No, no, this can't just be my lot in life. Uh, I'm going to try everything again this year. I'm, I'm going to make sure this, this is the last year I've got it. Uh, try anything to how stupid it sounds. I'm going to do it. I'm going to throw everything I can at this thing. Um, the first thing I want to do is just get better drugs. <laughs> Right. <laughs> my doctor didn't give me better drugs. It's like, okay. Uh, and so I like, tried all sorts of stuff. Um, and how did it happen? I was, I was managing like carpet stores and stuff. And I was, I was looking at buying this other guy's store and just like have my own carpet shop. And I was like, and I wasn't, I wasn't into this world <laughs> that we're in now. Yeah, the weird and wacky world. Uh, but I was like, if if I want to throw every bit of money I've got at this business uh, and buy it off this guy, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not just check out my like my own logical things. I'll, I'll go see a tarot reader. This is the sort of thing you, you. Probably should just check if the ghoulie ghosts want to tell me to stay away from this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good thinking. So I went into this this new age shop. <clears throat> uh, I got a reading off this woman. Uh, she did. It, 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 it was it was a good opportunity. Uh, it'd work well. I'd be able to make it work and all the rest. Uh, and at the end of it, she gave me a business card and told me to like. Come back to her like once I'd bought it, and she'd help me find a way to make sure I started on the on the right pathways or something, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, or something like that. Uh, and I turned her card over and I said she did Reiki on it, and Reiki had been something somebody else before had told me to to try out, um, and they wouldn't do it to me because they'd had a weird experience and got spooked. Uh, 
doing an exorcism or something on somebody and I'm like, no. And so I was like, well, this was something I've been told to try out. So I'd like to look for that app if I can. Uh, and so like the next week, went to a house and uh, laid on a table and she did her thing and she didn't didn't touch me at all. It was all like non-touch Reiki. Um, later found out most of what she does isn't Reiki. Like there's a million one different types of energy healing things out there and um, Reiki is just one of the things that people know. So that's what she put on a, a card, which was true. Like that was the only word I knew of energy healing. So... Uh, she did a thing and I'm I'm really laying there thinking I'm wasting money. Like I'm imagining pulling money out of my wallet and setting it on fire. I'm laughing to myself thinking this witch is sitting in the corner playing out for cards or reading a book. This is the biggest fucking scam in the world. But I promised myself I'd try everything, so I'm trying it. And I don't know when it was. I, th- I think I think it was like halfway through the session. Uh, I was hyper aware of every sensation in my head uh, all the time from having this pain there for so long. And about halfway through the session, I could feel something coming out of the hole on the side of my head. I've still got a hole from the operation. And I could feel the energy coming out. And I'm like, holy shit, this, this, is, this is real. This, this witch is doing something. This, this is fucking witchcraft. She's, <laughs> she's the real deal. Like me. <laughs> uh, and so I was dumbfounded. And um, I, I probably only felt stuff for five or ten minutes. Um, I, I, I cannot remember. I remembered that impactful moment of feeling that. Um, and I still had the, the headache. The migraine didn't change or go. It was still there. But... That made me go, well, she, she's going to be able to get rid of this. Uh, so I went back every week for a while. And then other weird stuff started happening. Like my arms started moving without me moving them. And there wasn't somebody telling them where to move. That was just happening. And that spooked her out because she'd never seen that either. <laughs> uh, and so that had me extra interested in the process. First, it had me scared. <laughs> Right. That had me curious. Uh, and I was starting to feel a little bit better. Not amazing, but she took a few points off the, the pain scale for me. And then uh, I was trying meditation things as well, like float tanks, yeah. um, sensory deprivation things. I was trying that out and that that was good too. That was That was interesting. I'd had some weird stuff happen with that. Um, basically a self-hypnosis thing happened with that. I, um, I, I stopped drinking for a year. I couldn't drink after I went into the float tank with a hangover. Uh, I come out and the next time I tried to drink it, it just, I just couldn't. <laughs> just oh, wanted, no. It was, it was interesting. And, um, I didn't know how to meditate. I'm, I'm a person who's got aphantasia, so no inner images of I close my eyes and just see black. And all the meditation things I'd been exposed to were like some sort of visualization process. And so I was like, well, I just can't meditate. That's just not a thing I can do. Uh, and I was feeling frustrated at it that I could, I felt I was getting something out of the tank, but not what I should be getting. So it was like a, a Thursday night. I Google meditation class, Newcastle, this Saturday. And normally like the Buddhist centers and people like myself come up. None of that did. Uh, the only thing vaguely close to meditation that come up was a Reiki class that was on that Saturday, uh, about half hour away on a farm. Uh, I was like, oh. So I like typed an email out and said, this is still a spot. Um, can you have somebody who's got like no experience, blah, blah, blah. And then Friday afternoon, I get an email back from, yep, and yep. And, uh, so I'm out. I'll be there. 
So the next day I, I went. Uh, I didn't tell anybody except for my wife at the time uh, what I was doing. And I went there. They gave me the attunement and I had weird stuff happen during the attunement that didn't happen. Like I had sensations of like him pushing his thumb into my forehead uh, and he didn't didn't do that. It's not part of the attunement ritual. <laughs> but I felt it. And I asked him later, I was like, well, why'd you push your thumb into my forehead? What's that bit of the ritual? And he's like, mm, no, nah, I don't do that. <laughs> uh, but the first thing he taught us was was the energy ball. And and that moment just, it blew my mind. Like feeling that energy between my hands and 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 it being there from from me calling it just it had my attention big time like it was i remember one of the thoughts i had like decades ago i, I went to theological college i was i was going to be like a minister and stuff and so i was, I was pretty deep down the christianity route before uh, and before i got burnt by christians <laughs> Right. Uh, and then, um, and all through that, I'd never had like a real personal spiritual experience. Like it was all just logic and it was just, I don't like what know, someone sure. else, what someone else said, right? Like, it, it, yeah, it was, it was what somebody else said. And it was just going through the motions and doing things. And I knew, I knew lots of people who had Holy Spirit moments where like energetic things happened to them, where they'd talk in in tongues and stuff like that. My my mum can, uh, so I knew that was there, and it used to, it used to make me feel like I, know, I wasn't worthy when I couldn't do those things. And I, I remember praying my heart out one day to to get the pain to stop, and I end up just thinking, well. Yeah, the God exists, so he just does not care. It's like, get fucked. Yeah. And um, and at this moment when I'm doing this energy ball, uh, I'm like, this, this is God. Like, this is the Holy Spirit. This is this is that energy right here now. Like, and I'm not I'm not going through some process that somebody else has taught me like this guy has taught me how to hold my hands in a certain way and invite something. And, and that's it. This is, this is my own personal connection. And this is, this feels real. Uh, this feels amazing. And so from there, like he told me all different things of what to do with somebody else's body and stuff like that to, to practice Reiki, just a day class, just the basics. And I went at home and um, and I played with it every day. I spent heaps of time with it. Um, every second day or so, I'd, I'd find somebody that I could practice on. But most stuff I was doing with myself and a lot of this this energy ball. And um, and it would have been know, about a week and a half later. Uh, I'm leaving for work and I'm halfway out the door. I'm like, I'm, I'm forgetting something. Like keys, wallet, phone. I don't have a headache. Huh. I don't have a migraine. I don't need to get that. <laughs> Shut the door. Awesome. Head off to work with my mind blown. It just went. And and I wasn't actively trying to get it to go. I was I was practicing healing so that I could get it to go. Yeah. So that I have a couple questions after that. Um first off, what in your opinion like does it say about injury and sickness and and all that? What does it say about that stuff that reiki and energy healing work? You know what I mean? Um can you ask the question again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me rephrase it. What does it say about Reiki and energy? He what 
what does the fact that Reiki and energy healing work say about the what injury and what sickness is? Okay, yeah. Um, that's a pretty big question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so at, at different stages of my journey, I'd say different things. So, like, this has been a bit over a decade now that I've I've been on the the, the spiritual break consciousness journey, and now my view is that the our our energy is the blueprint for what the physical is and that's constantly constantly in flux so it, it's not instantly in flux that like i can think i have a bigger nose and my nose just grows instantly i think if i held the like thought process of i've got a super long nose uh by the time I die, I'll, I'll have like this big, full-on British nose or something. Oh, uh, yeah, schnoz magic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, and like the experience with your hand moving—that's uh, that's called an idiomotor response, and it's meant to be your thoughts moving your nervous system to to make that happen um from my own experience of what happened to me before i even knew about an idiomotor response or hypnosis or anything like that i had the exact same feelings from just energy uh i think our whole consciousness is is energy and and it affects our body and so <clears throat> Our energy is is our spirit, is is who we are. And it latches onto this physical form. And when we're younger, it's it's come with its blueprint that we actually physically grow off that it needs to do. But that keeps going. So the more people think of like crap that's wrong with them, the more they get it. Like there's yeah. there's a full on thing for medical students like first year medical students they get really sick wow i didn't know about that but that makes really good reading. sense yeah uh because you start reading this stuff and and you start looking for it within your body and your body creates it yeah uh, and so energy healing i think it's correcting some of that right uh without without the words of knowing what's wrong. And so, uh, yeah, before we recorded, we were talking about, like, when you're really off track, things that get you back on track can be really jarring. And, and when you're on track, that recalibration is just smooth and nice. And Like and if you've good. never gone to the chiropractor and you go in, it's going to be like, you're being torn apart, right? But if you go all the time, I hit this cable. Oh, sorry. But if you go all the time and you're, you know, you're getting regularly aligned, it's not going to be so um, jarring, right? Just at first, getting in, getting in alignment can be can be a little um, disorienting. Yes. Yeah. So. I'd felt a lot of shakeups initially with with energy healing as it was doing a lot of realigning, and then later on not so much until I touched on heavier subjects uh, again. But still, nothing like it was in in the beginning because of that realignment. So, yeah, I think I think it's it's a way of patching the the soul that helps redirect the body, how to heal from there. Um, that's it's like aligning, that's aligning the energy, getting the energy back into the, 
I don't want to say natural state, but in a more of a state of, of, of proper flow kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for some people it's, it's just not even there anymore in different spots and it's, okay, it's putting wow. some in there to kickstart the, the process again. Okay. Uh, wow. So you're like jump starting a, a car, like sometimes. Yeah. No, wow. like, I, 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 I'm not saying I'm like dug up a body. <laughs> the crayon, <laughs> would be cool to try. Reanimate it. Would be cool uh, to try. Would be. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I've, I've done it with plants. Uh, I've, oh, I've had really? plants nearly dead and I've energized them back to life. Wow. And I've had plants that were dead and I could not energize them back to life. Uh, but I've watched leaves like come back up from just giving them energy. Uh, so, yeah, it can be like jump starting. But for most people to get a healing, it's, it is just that recalibration. Uh, and for some, it's the interesting thing I know is for a lot of people, it's, it's, um, how would I say it? I guess it's like, I was like throwing gas on fire. Like it, it sparks something that they can't go back from. Like, like, like me, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't go back to pretending like that didn't exist. So you're saying it's like an initiation. Exactly. Yes. Uh, the, the amount of people I've met that Reiki is an initiatory experience, uh, is phenomenal. Uh, like you, you told me somebody spoke to you just the other day about, uh, a Reiki treatment that I'd given them that it, it was their initiation into, into this world. Uh, yeah, I've I've taught thousands of people Reiki, and lots of them I'm I'm still in connection with, and I've I've seen so many of them's lives switch and change from it. Lots not to follow the path of of Reiki or anything like lots didn't go down Reiki too or whatever, but like all the all the initial people that I used to teach, um, I become like Facebook friends with, so I like. I see their evolution and stuff and and you can look back and you see the point where their life changed and so that connection to reiki doesn't just connect you with this healing energy it it it, it creates this pathway that your spirit can then commune with you better in a sense that's what and i was can... going to ask you do, do you think that like the that kind of healing that energy or connecting someone with that energy for the first time consciously that it allows um, easier communication with their spirits and with their like possibly their destiny. Cause I also wanted to ask, sorry, go ahead. No, that that's definitely was all the same. Cool. Cause what that's kind of what I wanted to ask about your experience. Like, is there an extent to where, you know, obviously this is like what, what your, your calling is, right? But do you think that sometimes it takes a 10 year migraine to like put us on the right path? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a stubborn idiot. Like <laughs> I'm the same I, way, dude. <laughs> I needed that to do it. So like, um, I went back to work after a month off after the operation, uh, maybe two. It, it, it wasn't long. Uh, like I could still barely walk at the time. Like I could not walk and turn my head at the same time. I had to like walk my head forward. <laughs> Early I was returning to work. I was I was leaving messages on clients' phones saying my name was John. Uh I was not with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, it wasn't John. It was it was Bill, uh, mm -hmm. which which is also really interesting because three of my ancestors uh, are Williams, and one of them goes by Bill. Oh uh, wow! Okay. And so I wonder if he was working for me at that point. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> stepped not. in and took over for a second. 
and, and I didn't believe it at first when my boss told me I was I was leaving messages as this bill and uh he's like the woman played back her voicemail message for me and it's your voice and you're saying your bill. <laughs> okay. Uh but so that straight away when I come back, one of the ladies from the office um gave me the number of like an acupuncturist. Uh and I was like, oh, thanks, I'll, I'll call him up. And it sat on my desk, and I just looked at it, and I laughed. I thought, I'm not doing that bullshit. Like, some some old Chinese dude sticking needles in me is going to fix my head as if. <laughs> uh, now, now I do a lot of acupuncture-based stuff just without the needles. Uh, so that pathway got put in front of me for an energy thing right away uh and it, i didn't use it and Man. that piece of paper stayed on my desk while i was at that job for, for the whole time i was there so like i think i was there for another like three or four years and i could have called that guy and i never did uh yeah i needed i needed something big to get my attention to to make me do it, and uh, if if I had to, I'd, I'd do it again. Like now, I, I don't know what would have made me do it earlier. So if right. I was if I was my spirit guide, I would make me do that. Yeah, that's a really cool way to put it. Um, because it made me think early on when you were talking about like the person who you interacted with who they got scared away from it. And I was thinking, right, like you only get scared away when it works, right? Like I don't get scared away for something that's hogwash. So like something worked and they were like, okay. But for me, the, what I I thought about it from my point of view and it's like, oh, well they just didn't want it enough. (laughs) (laughs) Like, and in my experience, really like a lot of the time it took this desperation, right? So like by the time I'm seeking any of these answers, I am at a point of complete, like I'm bereft. Like I'm at a point of complete desperation. I'm at the end of my rope and I'll do, I'll go to any length. I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, Now, luckily I don't have to get to that point anymore. You know what I mean? Curiosity drives it more now, but it used to be, I was so stubborn uh, and for me, particularly, um, you know, the listeners know about this, but like it's addiction is the story. Right. And it's kind of a similar thing. It's a. Uh, it gets very desperate. And very dark. And I don't think it would have, you know, I don't think it would have gone any other way for me. And I don't think I'd change it as crazy as it sounds because it got really bad sometimes. But I think it's all what it took to get me where I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's <clears throat> hard times make us. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, I came, like, this place is a lot of fun. There's a lot of great stuff going on on planet Earth, you know? But it's, <laughs> I don't think it's like, it's very much like a hold my beer incarnation, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Do you want to hear about a weird experience? Yes, please. So I'm not I'm not an amazing hypnotic subject uh, for like actual trance-based hypnosis. Because like I said, I'm not visual. I can't see stuff. So like that doesn't happen in, in trance either. Uh, I can dream and visually I'll, I'll dream, but that's that's the only bit. But nobody's been able to get me there hypnotically. <laughs> and <clears throat> there's a couple of different ways you can do past life regressions. Uh, one is to like have the person on the journey and they're seeing the slideshow of of that inside and and relaying it to you. Um, and another is to take that to the next level where that other life has been channeled through the person. And you're you're communicating with it. That's my favorite one to do with people. So I'm having a yarn with somebody from a different century. Uh, always fun, always interesting, uh, always weird as shit. 
Um, and sometimes in ways that we can actually prove that it's real. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's too hard to get anything that's verifiable. So anyway, uh, I've, I've tried to get a past life regression on a few times and they've always tried for the take me on the journey bit and uh, it doesn't really work too well. Uh, but I get I get impressions, so I'll like I'll feel things and I'll I'll hear things in my mind, like a narration of, of what's what's going on and stuff like that. And um so part of the pathway of how she was taking me to there was to to step through this door and and there was this really rough wooden door, like super rough texture door with an engraving in it of of a tree with like roots and everything but it was it was upside down and that was puzzling me as as i was open the door it was like well, why the hell is the tree upside down uh and i went through and i was expecting to have more of this visceral thing like this door that was really grabbing my attention i was like i was, I was amazed she was getting me there because that was the first anybody had got me of a connection to it um and then and then she's asking questions and I'm answering them, but I'm not answering them. I'm in the background hearing my voice answer and my voice sounds different. And so she's she's got that second version of it where she's talking to the other life. Uh, I was like, oh, wow, this could be interesting. But as the dude starts talking, he's not another life. It's like it's like a life between lives. It's like she's talking yeah. to to my operator of 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 who who is all of my lives. Uh, so it was super super interesting conversation. I wish I had the recording. I know I recorded it on my phone. I could not find it in my phone later on. Disappearing uh, evidence is a thing too. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so he before this I didn't believe in simulation theory. Now I, I questioned a fair bit because he talked about like uh, this being a really hard game. Like this is this is the hard version. Like she she was asking how I was doing and he's like well, he's doing better than better than the rest of them. Did, but it's still shit. Like this, this is just an incredibly difficult game to get through what I need him to do. Uh, and he was talking about the the energy, uh, this free source of energy that we could just use. And he's like, he, he gets it sometimes when he's when he's doing his work thing. He gets it and he takes use of this energy and implements it. Uh, or like it's a free source. It's like, but he's not doing enough in his normal life. And and he's like, he's scared, he scared this woman and another guy that was that was there. He was he was talking about it's like there's a giant forest that's fuel. And all you would do is light a fucking match and set it on fire. And so they were thinking he was a crazy pyromaniac, but he was trying to say, well, that's how much free energy is there, but it's just the dormant tree. It just looks pretty at the moment. But if if you want fuel for a fire, the, the, there's a gigantic fire that can be just lit. Uh, and so he wanted me to light the match to make use of all this energy that's around me. Still have not been able to like do that properly. I'm I'm I'm, I'm still an idiot. Dude, <laughs> that's think? amazing. Okay, that's. Um, I got for one thing if the you know I don't use the video but like the audience can't see that my mouth is like hanging open right now I've also got goosebumps, it's goosebumps, up. <laughs> goosebumps all over my arms my hands my audio is dropping out <laughs> and um no continue uh if there's more um yeah so um he he was also really disrespectful to me about me. Like like he was he was talking about me like I was a freaking idiot. 
uh, it was not a, it's not a full loving part of my soul. Uh, there was frustration there. And I, but it wasn't, it wasn't at me, it's at, at all of me. And the way he was talking was like he's playing a video game and I'm, I'm the avatar and his control was busted. <laughs> wow. Was, was what I was getting into. Yeah, like. the machine's eating his quarters and stuff, right? Like, yeah. And, and Journey's saying, there's, there's better games out there. Like, there's easier ones, there's more fun ones. But this is where my friends are. And so, like, years and years ago, I used to be into like World of Warcraft and, yeah, different service. I'm Australian. So I used to play on a like, Aussie server so that that's where my mates were. Uh, and there was a few different Aussie servers. And if I went to a different one, when my server was down, my mates weren't there. And it was boring. I didn't like it. Man, uh, that, tracks were, that tracks for me. I used to play on, a, I used to play Ultima Online. It was one of the like older ones. Yeah. And uh, I would play on the Pacific server because that's where my friends were. <laughs> there you go. I have to stay uh, up so, late. So I'm in the background while he's talking. I'm I'm getting what he he's talking about. I'm like that, that, that's what he's talking about. And I could like I could feel him sitting around this big round table, like they're playing a digital board game sort of thing, and and all of his mates are there, and and he hates the game, but he loves his friends, and yeah. he, he's not there for me. He's there. He's there for this interaction with his community, and and I'm his way of doing that. Uh, and it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a downer in a, in a sense, <laughs> but it's also really intriguing. Uh, it messes with my mind a bit, uh, and and I feel part of that experience gave me a bit of a like a cheat code that I haven't really worked out how to punch in yet. Uh, but yeah, before that, I, I would have thought simulation theory was, was much crap, but now I'm like, well, there's that experience tells me there's something to that. Have you read any, uh, Michael Newton? No, I've got some of his books, but I haven't journey of haven't souls. Explored. <clears throat> yeah that reminds me a lot of what he writes about in journey of souls because he was basically doing regressions to that time you're talking about to that between time yep. to the life between lives and it definitely sounds like simulation theory mm. um and you know it and i there's something about that that strikes a chord with me too because I've dreamed about similar things. Like I've seen the place in a dream where the souls get um, their memories wiped when they go down, you know, um, and things like that. And there's there was a couple of things. I don't even I don't know that I really remember exactly what it was that led me to read that book. That was like, okay, there's something going on here. Um, that's really fascinating um all my friends are here so what yeah that makes me wonder like okay so why choose but like why choose it at all like why come here at all like why did the friend why are the friends even here you know what i mean like is it like something we have to do yeah i don't, I don't know i wished i wish you'd ask some questions like that uh so part of I was thinking about last night, like um last night I was sitting down having a drink for the first time in a long time because it was the anniversary of one of my, my best mate's deaths. <laughs> and so I, I took a drink to, to him every year. That's all right. It's part of life. Yeah. Um and the my other best mates from from that same time. We have a Facebook group chat thing, um, and it's it's a recreation of an IRC chat. So I'm guessing since you played Ultima, you 
Yeah. You're old enough of a nerd oh, yeah. to, to the IRC. Love it. <laughs> so we we had a, a a channel between us for like decades, like since since I was like 14 or whatever, we had an IRC room that we'd all talk to each other in. And um and about a decade ago we we shut that down because we only had it on we only had IRC MIRC on our computers for that channel to talk to each other. Yet right. we all had uh messenger that we'd use to talk to everybody else. I'm like, well, why don't we port it over? Uh and so we moved games. Uh we moved where the room was oh, to catch man. up to society. Uh they're not. They're still in IRC. Uh, yeah. that's that's kind of how I see it is like the cool kids there uh, and he's stubborn and he's like no I like this game uh, so his mate's like okay we'll stay yeah. we'll play like, uh, like if you have a friend that still uses VHS tapes because he, he just likes it he thinks it's cool <laughs> <laughs> um, okay yeah, I can I can dig that. That's interesting, uh, and I like I just like the idea that there's like some kind of the like that that sort of dynamic would even exist in this like multi dimensional panopticon of souls. Like, damn it, man, they got good candy bars there. You know, the extra bit I wonder with that is is this is where I get really meta with thinking about this is. How many characters are they playing at the same time? Oh, like, yeah. They got alts. It it felt, yeah. Well, it felt like it felt like there was just a table of like 10 people or something. And is that his mates gathered together and they're, they're running around in that server just as their, their individual characters or are they trying to like, yeah, play a bunch of alts at the same time? Okay. Multitasking or is there a bunch of these rooms of 10 tables that are playing in this existence and who what is there fucking npcs what what the hell <laughs> yeah there's all kinds of questions that's really interesting that you mentioned that because i do think and i've heard this from some other folks too and it it sparked my imagination right this idea of like an oversoul so they're like there might be multiple people on this planet that share an oversoul with me and that would be that that example it would be someone playing multiple characters or like even pieces right like you know the egyptians talked about seven souls yeah so it's I, like what if I, i'm what if someone's playing the leg someone's playing the arm someone's playing the the brain you know what i mean there's all kinds of crazy possibilities yeah. there yes well that's that also is part of how i I see consciousness. So over the past year, I've had a weird experience, a year and a bit. Um, I started doing demonstrations here. I, w- I was doing a, a night with a medium <clears throat> where she did mediumship demonstration and then and then I'd do a channeling demonstration. So I'd put her into a trance and I'd make one of the spirits that she was relaying messages from come through her and just talk. And the uh, first few times we did it, it was just like random things. Like, well, the first time it was like, there was a girl in the audience. Um, her partner had died in a car crash years and years ago. And he came through and like told her all the things that she needed to hear about that experience and answer her questions and stuff. And, and then the next few times we did it, it was just like randoms that followed her here that, we couldn't quantify anything about. And then the next time, um, it was it was a spirit that was going to get birthed in front of us, and and it had ten parts to its soul that got introduced each month as as we went through the processes, um, and. And it was showing us how a soul gets created. And there was like these 10 different frequencies of energies that work together to make up who 
Loris was. Loris was was his name. Uh, and it, it intrigued me because with how I work with hypnotherapy is, is a parts therapy approach. So there's different parts of your consciousness that pull you in, in different directions. So like that Inside Out movie um, kind of describes that process a little bit. Uh, a movie, a TV show from the nineties, I think, does it better. Herman's Head. That there's there's different parts to our consciousness of of who we are, and they're all vying for us to go in different directions. And uh, when I was studying Daniel Four's work, uh, there's a concept he talks about that as well of like the ancestors can be like reborn as part of you. Yeah, definitely. Follow you. And yeah. um yeah, so I, I see that. That's in the happen. Norse that's in the Norse cosmology like straight up like they mm. have that. Yeah. Yeah, and and you you see different things like that often. Uh, that are just strange and like like me leaving voicemails that said my name was Bill. Uh, is, is that because he's just following me around or is it part of me uh, fully? Is he part of me sometimes? Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and what happens this, okay, what happens when all the parts are working in concert to the best of their ability um, in full alignment? Is that... Would that... Let me bring it back, because there's another um, topic that you mentioned that I wanted to bring it back to, and maybe we can connect these. Is that maybe what it looks like when I light the match in the forest, when I really like get in touch with that energy. Cause why is it so easy to do it in one area, but not in another? Like, why can you do it at like when the guy was saying like, he can do it in the, at the work, at the workstation, but he can't do it in his regular life. Like, why is that so hard? Yeah. Uh, well, the work part of me is, is the, the energy heal. So, uh, I'm doing my job by plugging in, and when I'm not at work, it's like, well, I don't need to plug in in that sense as much. Uh, I, I plug in from my spiritual path, but I'm not, I'm not drawing as much power. Uh, but yes, I think when it, all of people's parts are in alignment and working together, um, that's that's the aim to have this cohesive thing to not have rebellious parts that are working other processes and so i think there's just a couple of folds that make that work so the first is safety like most parts that pull you in different directions is or what they deem as as safe so like um the the work part of you pulls you in that safety of you need your paycheck to to get rent and all the rest uh and the the lover part of you pulls you to safety of well this is where this bitch can break my heart and and ruin me and uh, I, I need to put a wall up here and, and stop some of this or i need to run or uh all these different attachment issues people have um they come from that point of protection. The the inner child has all these protection mechanisms against mom and dad and siblings from when you're a kid. And so they don't always agree with things. And so there's usually wounds behind all those protection mechanisms. Like uh, if, well, let's get bizarre. If every time I saw you, uh, I kicked you in the nuts. It wouldn't take long before every time when I see you, your hand's there. Yeah, and you <laughs> wouldn't see me after a while. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but you could mix that message up and go, every time I meet somebody for the first five minutes, I'm going to guard my cock because somebody's going to kick it. Yeah. Or like anyone that's wearing a uh, hat. Like if you wore a hat, yeah. it'd be like anyone that's wearing a hat. Yeah. Yes. And, and until that part of your mind gets, no, it was, let's play a stupid game. Uh, I just need to tell him, don't kick me in the nuts and, and he'll stop. Uh, and then I don't need to be guarded anymore. Uh, that's essentially all it really needed to be. Weird example, but. No, it's good. It it's it's really me. good. No, I, it's, it, it works. And so that's, that's a big part of why the parts are not cohesive because they're all harboring their own inner little wounds of what they're trying to keep you safe from. And then there's, then there's a point of your purpose. And so like the work part of me really connects with my purpose and it's, it's felt that flow of, yeah, this is, this is where I'm meant to be. This is what I'm doing. So it gets easy when you're in purpose, but well, the, the inner child or the relationship me or the father me or the whatever different version of me might not be in flow yet. Uh, so it, it can't get that extra level of it. Okay. So you've got to, tick these different boxes before you can get there. Yeah, that's and that's interesting. So what that brings to mind is the idea that you mentioned where like when you're doing Reiki, sometimes there's a whole part of the body that just doesn't even have any energy flowing. So is it possible that there are parts of our soul or our psyche, like these personalities within us that don't have any energy flowing? Like in the same way? Yeah, uh, I think there's often parts that are actively holding that switch into off mode. Wow. Yeah. I could to stop it too. from happening is, is what I, I see happen often. So uh, like, uh, well, let's say you, you had the love of your life. Um, and when you started truck driving, that relationship fell apart because, because you're on the road. Um, and part of your mind that, that handles relationships there might go, work isn't safe anymore. I'm going to sabotage the worker because uh, I want the relationship back. Uh, and on the reverse, if the relationship was toxic and you, you got out of one that wasn't cool, then the worker part of you is like, I had to keep on the road so that I, I don't get tied up with somebody who's going to control my life again. Uh, and so that's where inner part conflicts happen as well, where they're oh, actively yeah. sabotaging other one's role. But the more you get in line with purpose, the more it can tick both. So as long as they're safe, they'll usually all align with purpose once they feel safe. So you just make them feel safe. Yeah. And that and looks... that's go ahead, go ahead. Uh make them feel safe and heard are the, are the two biggest things. So like I said, I'm not working with hypnosis really. I'm just trying to have a conversation with the other. And when I started, I needed hypnosis to make that happen. Now I don't, because now all I have to do is make that part of you feel heard and understood and get this guy might be able to help me feel be safer. Uh, and so whenever I meet somebody for therapy, I'm imagining somebody's over your shoulder that's causing this problem that you want to get rid of. Uh, and I'm not looking at it to blame it. I'm looking at it to go, why would they be doing that? to keep you safe? Why would they be doing that, that out of a point of love for you? Like, why are they being an overprotective parent ruining your fun like this? Uh, and if I can communicate that back, that conversation happens really, really easy because it wants to talk and it can talk. <laughs> and if I haven't found that, that's where it gets harder to actually get it to talk. Wow. So, okay. That's really interesting. Cause that's really just like the same as 
I mean, obviously, but it's like the same as dealing with a person, right? Like, yeah, if we're having if we're having trouble communicating, the best way for us to get through to each other is to see it from the other one's point of view. Like, where the best way for for that to be resolved is for us to see it see it from each other's point of view to get to a point of communication where I, because you know most people are just doing their best, right? And like, a lot of the time people are just afraid. But if I think you're just an asshole, like it's never going to go anywhere. But if I understand like, Oh, he's just afraid or he's just, um, you know, maybe this has happened five other times and this is the time when it really just was too much. And so I'm catching that time. Like it's the, like putting it into context, yeah. putting myself in the context where I can understand that's really cool, man. Um, and so we can do that for ourselves. Yeah. I taught you the process of how to do it. Yeah. Yourself. So yeah, you can talk to those parts and 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 help bring them into alignment and and have that self compassion and understanding of I, I, I see what you're doing. I see why. Uh, the hard bit is trying to work out when those patterns happened from pre your conscious memories. So like most of us don't have any real memories from before we're five, uh, which is where most of the protection mechanisms start. <laughs> Right. And also, I would imagine it might be difficult to um, understand which part sometimes even, you know, because I think there might be, it's kind of like, it's kind of like how when you're, when you're doing magic, especially when you're just starting out, the most difficult thing to ascertain can sometimes be, what do I actually want? I feel like it's similar there, right? Like, but what part of me is this? Like, and that can be difficult for me to see sometimes because I'm going to be my own blind spot in a lot of areas. And for based on what you're saying, that part might be hiding too. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I, I can give you another weird story to help you understand. Please. If you like. Please. So uh, the same hypnotherapist um that did that life between lives sort of regression with me um she's a psychologist that i trained with hypnosis and reiki uh and she when i taught her she like she worked for a government organization where she she couldn't use hypnosis she was a government psych and so um she quit that and went into private practice. And so I, I invited her back to my hypnosis class as a freebie to like have her a vision so it was all good in her mind so she could have the confidence to to throw it into her practice because I, I, I highly trust her and, and think she's a great therapist and I, I felt she needed a, a kickstart so that she didn't waste that talent uh, going into her practice. And so... She's there. She comes up to me one day. She'd been like talking to this other girl at lunch. Um, and, and this girl had a chocolate milk addiction. She drinks way too much chocolate milk every day and and struggles with a weight. And so this, this woman, she wanted to have me do a session to like break this chocolate milk addiction. And, um, and she was asking me to do that as a demonstration for the class. I said, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea, but I want them to see how you do things because you've taken what I've taught you and you put your own spin on it, and and I like what you do, and I want them to see that. Uh, and just, she's not a, a fan of like public attention, but she she agreed to do it, so she said yes. So we sit down in the class, and I tell the class what's going to happen, um, and and the class throws me under the bus. They're like, "Well, we heard you talking to that girl." yesterday when she was talking about it saying you've got a chocolate milk addiction as well so we actually would prefer to see that demonstration on you Lance. if if she's going to be doing the hypnosis we want you to be the subject like, okay fair enough and so i set this thing up that the the therapy i got would also work on the other girl i spoke to her consciousness and said every suggestion that i get that's beneficial for you you can 
use your intelligence and creativity to like make work for you. I thought, this is great. It's going to be like a two-in-one session. This, this will be interesting. And it quickly turned into not being helpful for the other girl. Um, so it started just as idiomotor response, hand things um, like, like what you've experienced. Then it, it moved into like what you call an ego cognitive where she hit a wall and she didn't know what else to ask. So she's asking this part of me to give me a clear thought or an idea of what it was. And then I started to relay it and I'm telling her what he's telling me. And she's phrasing that at back as questions to like check that it, it is what's coming through. Uh, and there's like, I don't know, three or four relays of these bits where I'm translating what I'm getting inside to her before he just takes over. And and so my voice now is, is this four-year-old me talking. Uh, and the four-year-old me is what prompts me to have chocolate milk. And when I was four, I broke my femur bone in my leg. And so I was in hospital for six weeks with a broken leg. And so four-year-old me felt scared and isolated in hospital for six weeks. And the the 80s were a different time. There wasn't like a children's ward in a a country hospital. It was like it was in in a ward with a bunch of other beds uh, or with a bunch of other people. And um, and there was no place for like my parents to sleep there every night and stuff like that either. So I was there on my own a lot, and the nurse looked after me, and she had all the other rooms to check on as well. So she wasn't always there. So it was it was quite a harrowing time for a four year old boy. And when my parents, and, and, but I don't remember it being harrowing, oh, uh, but his experience does. Uh, and so I'm hearing all sorts of things I didn't know happened um, from this boy talking through me. And he prompted me to have chocolate milk because, well, mum and other visitors would bring me chocolate milk sometimes and it made me feel safe. And so whenever I was stressed and overwhelmed, four-year-old me would prompt me to have chocolate milk to make me feel better. Um, and... Yeah, and it was like he talked about hearing um, hearing an old guy die on the on the bed opposite me. Um, he heard him take his last breath, and like the guy was talking about how he was going to die there. And so four year old me thought, "Oh, maybe I'm here to die. Wow. Am I here to die?" Uh, and was holding that question. So she helped release that question from from this four year old me. Um, Apparently, uh, apparently my brother broke my leg. I don't, I don't have a clue about that. Uh, I just remembered the story I was told or what I told people uh, was that I I just tripped walking on wet grass and broke the biggest bone of my body. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and, and nobody ever believed that story. And now that makes sense of why nobody believed it. Apparently my brother pushed me uh, and did something. Uh, didn't get many details. I haven't pushed about it. Uh, and so I've got that story. Can't do anything about it. Um, I don't like blame my brother for it because, well, it could be, it might not be real, but it sounded hell of a real uh, in that experience. But so from then on, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like chocolate milk. She helped heal four-year-old me that he didn't need it. And then if I felt like chocolate milk, I really knew what was up. So that was my big alarm bell from that point on. If I had a feeling of chocolate milk, it was like, oh, he's, he's telling me things are not cool. I need to do something about this. And yeah. so I'd be like, what in my life is prompting this chocolate milk today? And what can I do about it? And so I'd have the chocolate milk and I'd be talking to him going, thank you. Uh, I'll do something about this. And sometimes it was for him. Sometimes it was for me. The other thing is, when I told when whenever I tell this story, I end up feeling like a chocolate milk afterwards because I brought him to the forefront. <laughs> yeah. So like, if I talked about it in a hypnosis class, then uh, if we go to lunch, I end up having a chocolate milk. I just can't not. Uh, yes. And so last year I went through a bunch of trauma, and he was prompting it every day, but there was nothing I could do about it 
so it was just a i'll i'll have it and i'm sorry we're, we're going through this mate but i had compassion and understanding with it so now every time i have that it's it's real purposeful and it's not just it's not just sugar Lance, do you understand like i i think you probably do but i want to ask it like like this anyway that what you just described is like a devotional relationship to a spirit like <laughs> That is <laughs> so wild, man. Like, yeah, but it was it's four year old me. It's four year old you. And I bring like so just in the same way that I bring like the ancestors some coffee and some tobacco and some water or whatever it is they liked. And I say, Hey guys, thanks. Um, I remember you. And the way that smooths things. So in the same way that dude, that blew my mind just now. Mm. Okay, because I've got some things going on with me that I it's helping me see. Okay, there's a couple other things. One, I think it's really interesting how the catalyst, or not the catalyst, but the um, the symptom of the fear response, the symptom of not feeling safe, became the the barometer for you that okay something's up. And I think I've been thinking about this a lot lately, how my fear, it's actually like pointing me in the proper direction. Like it's, it's pointing me in the direction that I want to go in. If I didn't want to go in that direction, I wouldn't have the fear because I wouldn't care. Yep. But I've got the fear around the place I want to go because I'm worried I won't be able to do it or I won't get there or I won't do it right. It's the same sort of thing. Wow. So last year, a couple of months ago last year, uh, I let migraine come back for me. Wow. Uh, I went on Brian and Kurt's show uh, about talking about pie and uh, the movie. Yeah. And uh, I, I, shared, I shared that then because it, it, it just started. Uh, and I, I'd sit in there like I wasn't just going to heal it away. Or I was going to listen and find out what it, what it was. And it took me a few months. <laughs> it took me a few months. And it wasn't wasn't fun. And I battled with like feeling like a fraud. Like uh, I'm a healer, and and my healing career started from healing this migraine, and and now here it is, fucking destroying me again. <laughs> What the hell? Um, and and so I kept listening and looking for the patterns, um, and I found them. And the very last time I had that migraine was after I noticed it, and I tried to talk my way out of it, and I couldn't talk my way out of it. I'd sat and I agreed, like, okay, next time that. That happens if I can't fix it by the next time it happens, like, oh, oh I'm out of it. I'll, I'll stop doing that thing. And um, and so the next time it happened, um, I was like, okay, that's it. I'll, I'll do the thing. And instantly, the migraine stopped being a migraine, and it was just an energetic sensation there. So it had the same shape and feel, but it wasn't pain anymore. And it stayed around uh, and until I did the thing. And then it hasn't been there since. And I'm like, it, it was the same thing. It was chocolate milk, but it was a migraine. And so, it, yeah, uh, how you'd said of like, did I need a 10 year migraine? Um, part of me was like, if you need a 10 year migraine again, I'll give it to you again. If you won't open your eyes to see this thing, you need to change in your life. Yeah. The um, cool thing is, once we get the experience, we don't have to do that again. <laughs> we can, yeah, we, so, we can, but we don't have to. So that's it. So I, I had like, I had a dozen migraines maybe last year. Um, if that, I should have wrote down every time they were there, but I didn't. 
uh, they were continual. They were on off to grab my attention. Um, and they stayed on longer than I would have liked. But again, I needed it. And so Man, that's, that's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that with me. That's cool. That's part of that. Like, how does Reiki affect us? Um, and your initial question is, and, and, and this is the bit that messes with me. Was it me? Or was it one of one of my spirits that was doing that? Uh, I don't know, but either way, I have the gratitude for it, and I'm following the message from it. And I've just worked out an extra language of communication with something that has my back, whether it's me or our outside of me. It's aligned with my purpose, and is is going to fuck my shit up to make me stick to that purpose. Dude, it's it's kind of like how when you relate to a spirit enough, it becomes integrated into your very consciousness. Like the conversation, it becomes like a voice. And this sounds crazy, right? But it becomes a voice in your head, right? Like, and they have words for like con- conscious, uh, or sorry, knowledge and conversation, um, head spirits, whatever you want to call it. And so what you just kind of described is like, okay, I come into relation with the thing, it smooths out the relationship, and then all of a sudden it sort of becomes integrated into me as a as a companion. Yeah. So what my my working theory of consciousness uh, is it's not, not super popular amongst hypnotherapists. It's a little bit controversial in that regard. Um, but this this is based on my experiences of what, what I see. Uh, how I said, like, our, our soul is, is our energy. What, what I think is happening, I do not think, like, the pink squishy thing inside of this skull is, is me. Like, our brain is, is not where our thoughts are. Oh, right. Uh, I think, I think our brain is an antenna. Yeah, and it's the processing thing that's just processing this signal that's coming through of the energy that's around us. So our energy field is is us, and the brain's picking up on that. But like, if we're in the same room as each other, my energy field is overlapping yours. And sometimes I can pick up on your things. I might feel something in my body that's that's actually yours, or I might pick up on one of your thoughts. Uh, I'm sure you've had it happen with people before that, like, they start talking about something you were thinking about earlier. You're like, how did this happen? Couples and siblings that like finish each other's sentences. That's that's where that overlap is strong. In in that animistic view where. We're on spirited land. Um, we can sometimes hear and feel what the land is saying. Yeah. Uh, we've got we've got spirits that follow us around, some temporarily, some continuously, a whole life. We're hearing and feeling them. The interesting thing I've noticed is most of us have no clue what is what. We just think that's us. But the more you start to feel it out, the more you get to know, oh no, that's that's not me. That's that's that other. And so I think there's a big blend of all of all of that. And the the closer you come in relation with those things, then yeah, the more that is you. If you've got if you've got an ancestor spirit, you're given coffee or booze or water or cigarettes to whatever. Uh, they might before have sometimes hung around you, sometimes hung around like other members of your family, sometimes hung around just somebody who smoked a lot or drank a lot to be able to get the the thing kinder. Now you're giving them something. They're like, well, here's the guy who wants me here. Here's the guy who looks after me. And here's the guy who probably will actually hear me more. I'm going to stay around him a hell of a lot more. Um, 
And because you work magic, you're also probably the most interesting to them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they fall around more. But when they start, they might be in the back corner of the room. But the more they're watching, the more they care about you. Uh, and the the more you're given to them, the more they want to be close to you. So then they start to be here. And they're paying close attention to everything you're trying to do. So then they're trying to give you that helping line. And then, yeah, the lines blur between what's you and what's them. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's when it gets real, real funky. <laughs> I love yeah. it, though. I love it. Uh, the other bit that gets weird with that is past lives also interact with that. Right. Um, and and we're, we've got zero consciousness of understanding that that's, that's what that is. And so sometimes those protection mechanisms are, are this frequency of for past life. Of, well, this is, this is how I literally died. So I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen again. Man, um, what it got me thinking about too when you were talking about about that was Okay, so if that's the case for these spirits, like, what does that say about us feeding those negative stories in our head? The same thing's going to happen, right? Like, the more I feed that negative story, the closer it might be in the corner of the room, but if I keep feeding it, it's going to come closer and closer. That's exactly it. And so that loops back to that, what does Reiki do? The the energy grows based on the stories we're telling ourselves. So you're feeding that blueprint more. Like the story is over there. You engage with it more. The story's here. Uh, the negative blueprint wasn't in your energy field to begin with, and you've invited it in by talking to it more wow, and yeah. bring it there. So depression and anxiety, they're the, the spiral loops that create the negative things. And so we're, we create a lot of our problems in our body from our thought processes. And so a big part of my my job, how I see it, is to say, yeah, I acknowledge you, that story over there. Uh, I'm not going to dismiss you straight away, but I'm not engaging in that story. Like, let's flip the coin. Let's see what the other side is. Like, yes, that danger's there. We don't need to keep talking about the danger. We need to talk about the solution. We need to help fix this rather than just wallow in it. And... And that's where the alchemy happens. That's where where you get that change and, and life becomes interesting. So like I love a negative voice. As as weird as that sounds. Because I know that voice can be heard. So it's got power. Mm. Wherever that's coming from, that's really strong. And if I can work out the why and I can help meet that why without it being a problem, I've got a very powerful ally. And so that's what I'm looking for in every client is how can I find that purpose with that problem part of them uh, uh, or spirit that's attached to them to give it a to give it a way of feeling that purpose how the client wants it. Uh, their life's going to be amazing. And it's so chocolate I'm, milk I'm, again. It's chocolate milk again. I'm always quoting uh, Uncle Ben with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, like, totally. I hype up how powerful this part is, and it doesn't feel powerful. Uh, it's it's just a whinger. Uh, oh, you you heard they they engage in conversation with you all the time. So let's make that message mean something. Let's let's get the solution out. Let's keep them safe for real, rather than just setting the alarm bell off and warning them all the time and scaring them. Let's let's put the fire out. Yeah, because it, I mean, it usually like it's the same. It's the same thing we've been talking about because it. It usually is just comes from a malformed idea I have. And then that becomes just kind of a loop. And then that becomes the negative story. When really like you like with great power comes great responsibility is a great way to put it. Cause I think, and I was just talking about this with, um, with Lindsay Stark, that these things always hide superpowers, like the superpower, like, and um, I think it's Joseph Campbell that said the cave you fear to open, to enter holds the treasure you seek. Yeah. Like I, I go to where the dragon is because that's where, that's where the horde is too. Like the dragon and the yeah. horde are the same at the same party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 
Do you want a slant dragon? Or do you want a dragon as a pet? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Dragon rider. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want that as the ally who wants to share his gold with me and burn my enemies. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Exactly. <laughs> you know, because it's um it's so interesting because Oh, that's like it's it is also the archetype of Saturn, right? It's that that limitation that as we as we grow older and gain wisdom, like it becomes wisdom, right? Like that that thing that I've struggled with my whole life, that thing that I saw as like a chain around me, if I'm able to come to terms with it in my old age, as I become Saturnine, it becomes wisdom. It becomes a way of moving in the world that I, that others will not have because they didn't have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's great, man. Dude, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm glad. I think that's a good, I think that's a good stopping point. Yeah. Befriend the dragon. And it's the yes. year of the dragon too, so that's perfect. <laughs> there you go. I'm trying to, dude. I'm trying to become the dragon. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, if you keep that same model, like you bef- befriend the dragon enough, uh, it becomes you. Oh yeah, it's just like we're talking head. about. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, I dig it. But you try and be the dragon, you won't. Right. Right. Because yeah. Okay. Explain a little more. Say right. more about that. Well, if you're trying to be it, you're gonna keep failing because you you don't have a tail, you can't breathe fire, you don't have scales, you're you're not a dragon. But the more you befriend it and bring that closer, the more you've got the blueprint of the energy of the okay. dragon. That you will start to grow scales and a tail and breathe fire. And you won't be trying. You're just being. I'm just being it. Okay, this is interesting because I think it's the same. It's energetically, that's how it all works, right? Like, it's, and actually trying to be the dragon is operating from a place of not being a dragon. Yeah. Think, <laughs> think about it in reverse. Uh, when it's depression. Like, does anybody try and be depressed? Right. No. Uh, if they can, do they pull it off? No. The they're just acting up to get some fake sympathy of somebody and then it usually gets seen through because uh, you can't hold that pretend. Uh, but the more that story comes to them, the more they bring it closer and the spiral grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and, grows and, and it becomes a, a thing. Nobody becomes an alcoholic overnight. Right. It grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Nobody yeah. becomes a pack a day smoker overnight. It grows and grows and grows. All yeah. these things, we don't try to be it. We just become it by inviting it closer. So the good thing, don't try and be it. Befriend it, invite it closer, spend more time with it, and all of a sudden you'll notice you're it. Awesome, man. Lance, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a great time talking to you. I'm sure I'll have about a hundred more questions um after we after we end this call because you really like that was great. Um anything else you want to mention before we go? No, no. Um oh I guess if uh if people wanna befriend some dragons and uh change the message of that depression or anxiety or change a habit they've got, reach out, branchofthealing.com.au. Uh, you can book online. The My my booking schedule is just like nine to five Aussie time, uh, but I'm used to working with people around the world. So if you shoot me an email, if my time schedules don't fit, I can find other times to make one fit. Awesome, man. Thanks again for coming on. And, uh, I hope you have a great, uh, you got Sunday there, right? Yes. Have a great Sunday.
I will. You too. Thank you, man. Talk to you soon. Do you experience weird shit? Do your parents not like to tell their friends about what you do in the woods? Do you make more friends in a graveyard than you do at a party populated by living humans? Do you have interactions with beings that are not strictly considered human? Do other people look at you like you're crazy when you mention talking to trees in casual conversation? If you fist pumped or even just answered yes to any of these questions, you may be a nightbird. So let's sing together. If you'd like to come on the show and flap your gums with me, share your stories, or just talk about the malleable nature of reality for a while, then send me an email at tim at nightbirdpodcast.com. That's tim at nightbirdpodcast.com. I'd love to have you on the show. But until then, I gotta fly. But before I go, let me say this. Remember, you are never alone. I believe you. <laughs>